So this is, uh, I don't even want, know what day it is. It's Friday the 7th of December? Is that right? Friday the 7th of December. And I just landed in LA about three days ago. And one of the first things we wanted to do was catch up with uh, David, David Wilcock, who's become a very good friend over the last few months since our last interview. And we're in a beautiful restaurant here. We just had dinner. We happened to have our cameras in the back of the car. And we found ourselves having such an interesting conversation, we figured that we'd better capture this for the benefit of anyone else who's not, who's not here, which is the way that Camelot always likes to operate, if we possibly can do, is to provide for the viewer the best possible substitute for not being here in person. So we wish you were here with us in person, and this is the best that we can do. Yeah, uh, we're here at the Inn of the Seventh Ray. This is a restaurant in Topanga, California. It's one of my favorite places to go. Uh, and they were kind enough to allow us to use what's called the church room. So this is where we are right now. Uh, we've been discussing some very intriguing material, as probably most of you now know. Uh, we did a video, uh, I did a video with Bill and Carrie, who are both here with me at this time. And we went through a variety of different subjects, but the primary focus is what's really happening in the world right now. We're seeing uh, uncertainties and tensions unlike anything in recorded history. We're seeing government turmoil economic turmoil. Uh, most people want to believe that the government is sort of like a benevolent parental figure that can be trusted implicitly, and there's more and more information that not only are, is there institutionalized corruption, but that there's a great deal of information that relates to uh, visitors from other planets who are actually coming here at this time. And uh, both, both Bill and Carrie have been doing a phenomenal job, in my opinion, of bringing out this information to the world. Um, so you've heard a little bit from Bill, and let's hear a little bit from Carrie. Uh, thank you, David. Actually, what we're doing here is we're very interested in comparing notes on two of our witnesses, which is uh, David's Daniel and our Henry Deacon. And we have found in the past that there are actually some times when they correlate or agree on certain certain aspects of their testimony about what's go really going on out there. And we're fascinated to find out um, because we just heard from our Henry Deacon, um, and in particular we're going to kind of concentrate on Bill because Bill spent some quality time, as it were, with Henry Deacon over the past week. Um, and I spent a little bit of time with him, but most of the time Bill was with him. So Bill is going to be contributing what Henry Deacon had to say, some updates about where he's coming from, what he, what he had to say in the past, and then maybe a little more specifics um, in terms of what the future may hold. Um, in, and then David has uh, some testimony from Daniel, we understand, that we've never heard from. Um, and that is, uh, or, or, or maybe, some, some very um, interesting disclosures mm. about what Daniel encountered in the past in regard to Montauk and a few other things. So we are talking about the deepest, most concealed aspect of the UFO phenomenon you could possibly imagine. These witnesses are the absolute cream of the crop. We're talking about stuff that you have not seen in the Disclosure Project, stuff that has never come forward before. We're talking about the most esoteric, the most difficult to comprehend and understand as something that could even possibly be true. And it's to the point that I do get emails from people when I describe some of the Daniel testimony who simply cannot get past the barrier of their own belief around it. So it is important to note that this video is a continuation of what we already started before. Uh, the intent is for you to be able to participate further in this discussion. Now, why I'm so excited today, frankly, is that Bill came here with all this new information that I don't even know yet. So you're going to get my first-hand original reaction as I'm actually hearing this for the first time myself. And that's pretty rare and unusual to be able to capture that on film, but that's what makes this good video. So um, I think I'll just start in giving you a little bit of, of a backstory on this 
because actually it was my writing about the Henry Deacon story that in fact brought about the collaboration with Project Camelot in the first place. Um, just to recap very briefly what the original story was with Daniel, I have a, a large background in the UFO field. I've been researching it for many years, and I also have had what appear to be contacts with my own source, so to speak. And during that time, uh, I was able to make the acquaintance with someone who told me that he had worked on the Montauk Project. Now, you've got to understand, this is probably the most controversial. Um, what can you think of that's more controversial than Montauk? I mean, <laughs> my, my experience of Montauk, my personal experience of Montauk, was, was, was exactly the same as you described in your first it's, interview it's with totally us. It's totally ridiculous. I thought it was nonsense. I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even read the books. I know that you picked up the book to read his entertainment. I wouldn't even I read, read the first one. And just as you encountered Daniel, and he started saying, listen up here, this is real, and I was there. I had exactly the same experience with Henry, because in our first interview with Henry, Montauk occurred in the conversation. I can't remember exactly how, and he said, yeah, sure, that was real. It's a 40-year time loop. Um, Albilek says some weird things sometimes, but basically the whole thing is true. And at that point, I started to pay very, very close attention. Some people might not know the basis of Montauk. Why don't you, just so that we keep everybody in the conversation. Oof. Off to you. I'll, okay. Bottom line... The seat inside a UFO is more than just a seat, it's an interface with your consciousness. Now remember, if even one UFO sighting is real, then we're not alone in the cosmos. If even one disk is actually a saucer, it's not built by us, but built by somebody else, then you have to have a warp technology because we've seen disks that have disappeared in the sky. So here's the idea, you're in this chair, you focus your mind on a particular place you want to go, it opens up a wormhole in front of the saucer, you fly through the wormhole and you end up going where you want to go. So the testimony that I heard from this man who calls himself Daniel, it's not his real name, has never been duplicated. So I've had some people email me and say, oh, well, I've heard everything that you said before. Well, we only covered the part of Daniel's testimony in our last interview mm -hmm. that was already the same as what was in the Montauk books. I've heard other stuff that was not in the Montauk books. And you're Henry Deacon has all this stuff that's not anywhere, but then I'm reading your website with his testimony and I'm going, oh my God, this is the same stuff that my guy Daniel was saying to me. Now, and it's, it's ridiculously specific information, much too specific to have been just a chance overlap. So what you start realizing is we're talking about a unified construct here. So Montauk is basically a reverse engineering of a ship of a, of a seat from a UFO so that human beings are trained to run the chair with their mind, open up a vortex, send people through, some people might make it, some people might not, and then eventually trying to basically stabilize this so that it's a usable technology. That's the basis of Montauk. It sounds very far out, but you have to understand, like Philadelphia Experiment, if that's true, it's probably only the first time that that was done, and it was perfected over the course of years afterwards. So, yeah. I had the fascinating experience of sitting down with Henry personally and showing him the video of you talking about Oh, really? Daniel. I didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> we sat together, we watched this video, and I was just like, okay, let's... and. This is like the reverse corroboration here. This is like finding out from Henry whether what Daniel was saying through you was, was accurate or not. Mm. And he watched, the, he watched the whole thing, at least that whole section. He just nodded. And, um, and what was really interesting was he couldn't remember your name. He kept calling you the blonde guy. The blonde guy. <laughs> so he said, what that blonde guy was saying, he said, <laughs> what the blonde guy was saying was absolutely correct. Really? He said. But he I'm said, um, I mean... um, with one small variation, and, this, and this, is, this is just one of these lovely little touches. And it's yeah, like, I haven't heard any of this. It's like you know this is real. He said, what did he say it was? He said, um, it's, it's, he said they're not called stargates. It's jump gates. Jump gates. Jump not, gates. No, 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 no. He yeah. said, he said they're jump rooms. Jump he said they're rooms. jump rooms. Um, and, and I started to pay very close attention, because this is the kind of, it's like, it's not, 
But then afterwards, I realised that you'd said it was called jump gate technology. But I was talking with Henry, and I was talking about jump gates. So I changed it a little bit with my own memory. And he said, no, they're jump rooms. I Daniel said, didn't know hmm. what... Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if he had the word jump gate from them or not. But basically, hmm. for in case you, you're not following this, a, a jump gate is allegedly a stable, traversable wormhole between two locations which works whenever you want to go. That's, I'd heard that it was probably called Jump Gate. Daniel wasn't sure. So now you're saying that it yeah. was actually called Jump Room. It's called a Jump Room. And I'll tell you what a Jump Room is. And maybe you can get it as I'm describing it. Okay. Just as Henry started to describe it, and I got it immediately. And he said, it's a, and I said, what, you mean like an elevator? And he said, that's exactly what it's like. He said, there's a room like an elevator. You go in the doors. The doors close behind you. Then the doors open and you're there. He said, it takes no time. You feel a bit weird. He said, but you go, you're, you're, in, you're in, in Europe or England or the UK or in some, or underground somewhere. He said, there are a few of these things in different places. The jump rooms. You go into the jump room, next thing you know, you're on Mars. You can go there for lunch. You can come back. It takes no time. The personnel get there that way the heavy equipment has to be taken with these large advanced spacecraft they've got. Okay, so we're, again, I, I'm hearing people laughing, okay? <laughs> it really is a good idea to have watched the first video before you watch this one, because based on Mars, jump gate, jump room, oh my god. And I get that, and you have to understand now, some of there are a variety of witnesses out there and their testimony is so explosive and it is so beyond what you think you know is true that we can have this discussion because we we've, we've spoken to you know between the two of us we've probably spoken to 30 of these guys they're real and you can tell they're real because they're they're freaked out sometimes talking to you i mean yeah um there's it, it, it's, it's such a huge story that ever since spending a few days with Henry very recently, I went back to my, uh, uh, the emails I was getting on my computer and reading the stuff you get on the forums and on blog, and I was thinking, you know what, these guys don't, they really don't know what's happening. The powers that be really don't, know, don't have much to worry about. Because most people really, really don't know. There's not, a, there's not one colony on Mars. There are several. Mm, I didn't know that. Um, this is just... This one we've been talking about here is just the largest one. One of the things that Henry told us um, was he was reluctant to talk about um, uh, the so-called secret space program, the alternative space program. Oh. He actually believe he's worried that if we go doing the unthinkable and 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 start congressional inquiries and, and, and real investigations as to where the trillions of dollars have gone and what these scientists are doing and all these bases that don't exist and so on and so forth, somehow the whole thing might be frozen. And Henry was he said, This must not happen. He said, It's very, very important. You don't understand. He kept on saying, You don't understand, you don't understand. This is very, very important, and the future of the human race might depend on it. This must not be stopped. This is why it's important that it's classified. Hmm. Now my philosophical stance, and I'm sure it's yours too, is that actually the human race has a right to know its past, its destiny, its identity, what, what, um, uh, what friends and foes it, it, it has, what, what, what might be lying ahead of us, uh, what's at stake. We have a right to know that. Um, and um, Okay, what did he say about Total Recall? I mean, there you got a movie, Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger, he's in the chair, the chair's like the Montauk chair, based on Mars, mm. right? Mm. What is the, what's the deal there? Um, I actually, to be quite honest, I've had so many conversations with Henry, I cannot remember whether he referenced Total Recall. Did he reference Total Recall, Gary? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, we might have mentioned it in passing, yeah. but I don't recall um, anything really specific okay. that he said about that okay. movie. But it sounds like Daniel um, may have 
May now, we do it. have some information about 2001, the Space Odyssey, and oh, the... That's, oh, uh, no, no, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, but um, let me just close out yeah. the Total Recall as far as <laughs> what I know, because we can jump intuitively very quickly here. Sure. Okay. Daniel pointed out to me something that is sort of snuck into Total Recall that you don't really notice if you're not paying attention. But at the end of the movie, obviously if you've seen it, you know that there's an alien system that they find there, and Schwarzenegger himself actually puts his hand on this thing that fires off some sort of gigantic technology that puts these heat rods into the ice cap on the southern and northern pole, I would imagine, melting the ice back into atmosphere, which in turn basically makes the air of Mars breathable so that it's like a colonizable place. What you see at the end of the movie is that there's a, a, a mountain where the, the atmosphere blows out the top, and it's exactly in the shape of a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And they never talk about it, it just kind of happens. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Daniel said, now, now let me just give a background on Daniel so that we have context for our conversation. Daniel claims that he was a, a highly technical person, had a big background in technology, got involved in this project, got recruited uh, out of the Air Force, that he worked as a guard, but he also had other responsibilities, that this project was basically financed by German Nazis who had, since World War II, relocated to the southern tip of Brazil, that they had uh, funded themselves from gold that was in a train. All this is in the Montauk books. But he worked there, and he gave a lot of specific information about it. Uh, so the point being that when he saw Total Recall, he had memories of them discussing with him that Mars had been civilized, that there were people like us on Mars in the distant past, that this planet was loaded with artifacts, that there's all over the place are there artifacts, that there's pyramids there, there's the face, and there's all sorts of things you can discover there. And one of the things I said in the other video is that he had a photograph of two astronauts, or I don't remember how many astronauts it was, but that they're waving at the camera next to a gigantic pyramid, showing that they were there. Um, it also appears that Alternative 3, although it's loaded with potential misinformation, that Alternative 3 is kind of in the right vein, but apparently the actual film itself is a hoax, but the actual fact that they went there and that they found some degree of life still on the surface of the planet was, was apparently true. Yeah. So anyway, you were saying something about 2001, that you found some validation on that. Well, that's, uh, that's like another thread, if you like. Um, ever since we knew Henry, he was urging us to, to, to meet up, to communicate with Arthur Clark, Arthur C. Clarke. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, Actually, he uh, gave us a list of people to meet up with. And Arthur C. Clarke is one of them. Arthur C. Clarke was and one of the people. And he said, he said, Arthur Clarke knows everything. Now, only about a week ago, uh, he told Kerry and myself why. Um, hmm. Well, this is news no, to me. Okay. Let's say he, 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 he started giving a hint. He said, you know what Tycho is, don't you? Tycho. He was, he was kind of being quite urgent. Tycho, T Y C H O. Tycho is a big crater on the moon. On the moon. It's, a, it's a real place. Tycho. It's kind of on the southern bottom, and it's like a big splayed-out radial set of yeah. dust tracks yeah. from the crater. Yes. They found something in Tycho. They really did oh, find something. Because that's Tycho. where they find it. That's where they find the monolith in 2001. Isn't <laughs> that's it? where they find the black monolith. Exactly. Henry knows. They found something on Tycho, and they found something because it had created a magnetic anomaly. This That's exactly, exactly what it was in the book. Exactly following the book and the film. So then, of course, we said almost with one voice, what do you mean? They found a black monolith. He didn't know what it was. He right. didn't know what right. it was. But they found something. And he Except said... Except that there is a testimony from Arthur C. Clarke in 2007, November of this year, in which he's saying, if you get up to the moon, because he was asked to speak uh, for this um, this X Prize um, to you know for entrepreneurs going mm -hmm. to the, you know with um, innovative innovative space ideas, he said, How look weird. for a magnetic anomaly on the moon. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so so now Henry Deacon Henry is saying this. 
Arthur C. Clarke is actually yeah. backing it up here in 2007. Yeah. So um, we would like to, right now, as we speak, we're trying to establish contact with Clarke. He's 90 on the 16th of December. Right. He lives in time. Sri Lanka, He lives right? in Sri Lanka. He lives in Colombo. Um, he's still going strong. He's an elderly man. Uh, he's a Freemason, we've been told. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a bit of an insider. He knows everything that's everything that's worth knowing. And we don't know whether... We've got two people. We've got Henry telling us he knows, and we've got another person who's actually thinking of financing us to go because he's afraid that Arthur C. Clarke may pass on uh, sometime yes. soon and that you know this information would be lost. Whether or not he'll anyway. reveal it, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait right, and find but out. But to get back to the subject. Yeah. This is just a little snippet here. This is just one of, <laughs> one, of, one of Henry's hundreds of throwaway remarks. It's about, you know they found something on Tycho. You know, so but Henry did tell us to contact Arthur C. Clarke, Ben Peach, uh, Richard Hoagland. He said to get these people in a room together. There were a few others. Do you remember who they Stan are? Stan Tennant. Stan Tennant, right. Yeah. Uh, they all have a piece of the puzzle, basically, and the idea is to get them in a room, get them around a conference table just like this, and film them. And what was interesting, actually, here, apologizing on Henry's behalf for the absence of mentioning the blonde guy's name, <laughs> here, is that, of course, a lot of the work on the Enterprise Mission website has been in collaboration with yourself and well, Richard. Well, apparently and the, the, the specific paper that Deacon was so impressed by was the paper on interplanetary climate change. And Richard has gone public already saying that I basically did that research. It's over 120 references from NASA, which very directly state that the entire solar system is experiencing climate change. It's not just the Earth with global warming. Those type of effects, including brightness changes, magnetic changes, temperature changes are occurring throughout the entire solar system. And that's a documentable fact. That's not a superstition. It's been publicly released. It's just that nobody ever took all the different pieces and put them together in one place. That's all I did. And uh, that's why he was so excited about it, because yep. it proves that something is going on. Yep. In his work with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA, um, Henry had encountered all this a number of years ago, right. uh, including um, Actually, he, he Daniel that? said the same thing. Daniel said that Noah had discovered that the sun was actually becoming, um, it was going in the opposite direction of, of where they expect that stars usually evolve, um, that it was becoming, I, I guess it was becoming bluer and, and brighter, um, and that they, they were aware of this interplanetary climate change, but they were suppressing it from the people. And part of it was that they just didn't want to rewrite the textbooks about the way that stars evolve because they found out it yeah. was backwards. You know. One of the things that Henry told me just a few days ago is that the way the sun works is not the way they teach you at school. Oh, yeah. But he also said <laughs> yeah, there, is, you know, there is a, there is a yeah. brown dwarf. Henry said it was the second sun was a, a fait accompli, that, that this was just commonplace yeah. knowledge. This is what the South Pole Telescope is for. I mean, a lot of people have kind of cottoned on to that by now. Henry stated that to me in bold terms. He says, mm. you know, he said the South Pole Telescope is there specifically to observe this incoming object because it's going to be coming in in the Southern Hemisphere mm. when it comes in. Personally, I don't, I don't think the Planet X model has a whole lot of uh, validity. Um, it appears that the primary driver of the climate change that we're experiencing at this time is moving into a domain of energy in the galaxy. Uh, and actually, when we, when we talk about Dan Burrish's testimony, he's also saying his understanding of 2012 is that there's micro wormholes that are released from the sun and that this has some sort of hyperdimensional transformative effect on everyone yeah. on the planet. Yes. All that Henry will say um, is that there are a number of things that are all happening at the same time. It's like, um, this, is, this is my analogy, not his, my word's not his. It's kind of the way that I see it. It's like, um, it's like the way you get biorhythms and suddenly, you know, everything's happening at once. You're getting a kind of triple biorhythm crossover happening round about this time. You've got all these different factors are occurring. There's something to do with the galactic plane. There's something to do with solar activity. There's, you know, and there's, there's something to do with... Um, uh, 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 all the scenarios that are taking place on this planet. There's something to do 
with the population problems. There's something to do with what some people on this planet are trying to do to take advantage of the chaos that's going on around about this time. And everything is coming together, almost like the climax of some movie. You know. And just a few minutes ago, we were talking about whether or not we thought this movie was going to be a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> And we're both very optimistic. This movie's going to have a happy ending, but it's going to, you know, it's like kind of, you know, sit tight, you know, in your seats, because it's going to be, um, it's going to be quite a ride, I think, in the next few years. We were talking about. Yeah. This. Um, for those of you who actually are watching this video without getting the homework done first and watching the other one, uh, it's it's important to note that the philosophical underpinning of everything that I teach is in this series of books called the Law of One series. And that was something I discovered in 1996, which contained references to all this stuff that I've been reading for the last three years. So many specific references that I was convinced that I had to be dealing with something authentic. And approximately 11 months after I began reading the Law of One series, I began experiencing contact with what I initially called the dream voice. And this was essentially waking up in the morning, hearing the background chatter in my mind, and then trying to pick out specific sentence fragments, whether I understood what they said or not, and writing them down as specifically as possible, but the very important point being that there was no analysis going on whatsoever in my mind. The average person who says that they're channeling is essentially writing things down and making sure that they sound good. The mind has some degree of effect on this process. You say, you know, I want to write stuff that's, oh, I know where this is going, and your mind picks up on it and starts going along with it. Now. When I did this technique, a lot of it was very cryptic. You couldn't figure out what it was saying. It sounded almost schizophrenic. But it's because the subconscious speaks in symbolism. So as a result of what I'm telling you here, um, this knowledge that was imparted to me started to convince me, through the law of one and then my own further validation, that first of all, there is a one creator. The universe itself is an intelligent, living organism. It's an affinity. But the organism itself has created free will for each co-creator. And we are the co-creators. People like us, planets, stars, it's all different levels of the same collaborative effort that the universe is in which we're all given complete free will to do whatever we choose. And then from that free will, we eventually realign with oneness. So this is a programmed evolutionary curve that we go through in our history from essentially starting out as single-celled organisms through the animal kingdom, through the human kingdom, and then on up through. Um, the Law of One series makes it clear, this is 1981, that, that our galaxy has a personality in and of itself. It's like a, a super creator, so to speak. They call it the Logos. And they say that it has designed the human body as the form in which intelligent life will take on any given planet in the galaxy. Well, you were just telling me before we started filming, what was Henry Deacon saying about ETs at the at this Mars base? That they're all... Oh, yeah. Um, it might just uh, need to remind I'm, me on the specific bit, but... Everybody's human. Everyone's, everyone's humanoid. Um, going back to... This comment about the ETs on the Mars base, um, because he was there, <laughs> speaking from his, uh, his experience, had a population of 670,000. That's amazing. And, 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 and I said, yeah, I mean, Where, what? You know, 670,000? I said to him, are these all human? And he said, in his characteristically Delphic way, he said, he said it depends what you mean by human. <laughs> and the picture that Henry has always painted for us is that there is such a complexity of interrelationship um, in every way one can imagine in, in, in any kind of a drama between all these different visitors, um, all these different agendas. Uh, you've got um, benevolent guys, you've got malevolent guys, you've got people who are just observing. Um, every system and there are many, many, many systems, um, hundreds, thousands of systems Everyone's humanoid. This is the template. That's um, incredible. This is the template. Um, All right, but anyway. I, I'm hearing I'm yeah. hearing the, the audience. You know, just I'm, I'm, the obvious questions. The, I know you probably have millions of questions, 
And this sounds completely sci-fi, so if you can't accept it, just come along with us for the ride. <laughs> Take it all in is just sort of something to, to be fascinated by. But all right. A base on Mars. Where did it come from? How did it get there? Why are they doing it? What the heck is the point? Why do we need a jump room to get there? It's been there, it's been there for tens of thousands of years. Tens of thousands of years. Or longer. Um, it's under the ground? It's under the ground. It's at the, it's at, the it bottom, any... at the bottom of an ancient seabed. Oh. And that intrigued me, because while Henry didn't specifically say so, the implication was it was established when there was a sea. Oh, Mars has been, it. Mars has, been um, has experienced a number of catastrophes, both man-made and natural. The solar system itself has been through a number of cataclysmic cycles. As it as it kind of journeys sure. journeys through the stormy waters of the Milky Way, you know. Um, did, I'm sorry. Did he ever mention the Gore report? I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but Rush Limbaugh happened to go on the radio one day and talk about this thing that he read called the Gore report. And I have the recording of him doing this uh, and the transcript, in which he said that Mars had once been civilized with life like ours. That they found giant remains of bodies in, in big piles like Pompeii, that they were all basically flame-broiled bodies, uh, and that they had done DNA tests and had discovered that some of the Mars DNA that they found there correlated with people in the Skull and Bone Society. Hmm. And he said this on his radio program. This is not a joke. But then as soon as he did it, it was sanitized. Transcript disappeared from his website, but even to this day, I have a link that will take you to Russia's website where you can download him actually saying this on MP3. Uh, uh, amazing. So he didn't uh, I, say anything yeah. like that? Okay. Give us the link so that, yeah, we'll um, do that when we publish the transcript, we'll make sure that people have access right. to that. Uh, Henry Deacon uh, told us that he, he really relates to Bariska, who is the child, indigo child in Russia that we just interviewed, who has come forward with... Uh, conscious knowledge of a prior life on Mars. And um, he, they basically um, said that there was a cataclysm, Briska said, on Mars that destroyed it. And then, mm. and then this correlates with Dan Burish, because Dan Burish has been talking in sort of cryptic terms about the face on Mars and his investigations into that, and basically saying that the face on Mars and the civilization that was there is us in the future and that we are actually looking at ourselves in the future when we're looking at the face on Mars. Yeah. Um, I asked Henry pretty about, trippy. Yeah. I asked Henry about <laughs> that and he said that he knew nothing about that because when he was there, he was there in present time. I was asking right. him whether he time traveled. I said, did you go to the Mars in the future? What did you do? He said, no. He said, you know, as far as any travel is concerned, it was in, in present time. Hmm. And we said, what did you do on Mars? Hmm. And he said, I played a lot of ping pong. Yeah. Well. <laughs> That's what he said. I asked, yeah. I, but I asked, him, I asked him more about that. Um, Basically, he was doing exactly the same kind of job as he was in his installation um, uh, on good old planet Earth. He was there as a technical specialist in that particular job to, um, to manage and monitor certain items of equipment. Um, hmm. He did not get to explore um, barely anything. He was not on the surface. He wished he had been on the surface. He got to see out every now and then. There were little windows and things. The thing that actually triggered this entire conversation was when... Um, he was uh, uh, in the room that I was in at the time, and there was a beautiful, big um, uh, photograph of the Grand Canyon. And he, he was just kind of staring at this picture of the Grand Canyon, you know, with this kind of slightly glazed look on his eyes. And, and he said to me, you know what that reminds me of, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a red rock. And, I mean, of course, I immediately knew what he was talking about. I said, Mars, wasn't it? And he said, yeah. And... There's a place on oh, Mars called Vallis story. Marineris, which is a big, big canyon. Tell the story about what he said about the guy who recruited him and how they would sit. Oh, well, yes, this is, um, yeah. Uh, at one point, 
in Henry's career, he was recruited into NOAA, as we were just saying, National Oceanic and um, Atmospheric Association, or I say a project within within NOAA, because there's so much compartmentalization in, compartmentalization in um, all of these agencies. And the guy who recruited him uh, was somebody who had also been there on Mars. And there's something about these, um, my word's not his, the Mars veterans, there is something that is traumatic about their experience that Henry could not elaborate on. He told me that these two highly qualified, very sane, um, very brilliant um, uh, scientists working in these classical organizations, they would close the door of this guy's office and they would weep together because, they, because of what they had experienced together. And I said, well, that what did you experience? What, what was this? He couldn't tell me. I said, well, look, it sounds like fun. You go into a jump gate, you go to Mars yeah. for lunch, you play around with some equipment, which is all that we're doing on planet Earth anyway. Ping pong with an ET. <laughs> ping pong with an ET. And the ping pong is easier because the gravity is lighter. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and then he come back. I mean, this sounds like fun. And <laughs> he couldn't say. And every time I said, but what's the problem? He became anguished, but he couldn't say. And it wasn't that he wouldn't say. He couldn't say. It seemed to me that there's something there that either he could not remember or he would not remember or he was not being permitted to remember. This is my guess. Hmm. I don't know if there's anyone out there um, who, who does have any, who has been part of this, you know, then for goodness sake contact either David or ourselves. At the moment we're just really guessing because we don't what? know. Uh, okay, but I just... Why would we no. need a Mars base? I mean, what's the point? I asked him what the is function is. Is it like for an evacuation if the Earth gets in it's, trouble? Or? Yes, it's one of the functions. This is why Henry was adamant that he did not want anything to happen that would prejudice the continuation of the secret space program. Because he said, "This is," he said, "We're on a ship, and the ship might sink. These are our mm. lifeboats. You know, don't go wrecking the lifeboats." That's boat like systems. the alternative three thing. This is this again. is the alternative. Yeah. This is the alternative three thing exactly. This is the you, idea yeah. of being. You know, that certain people basically yeah. get out of here. He's, yeah, and s certain people, let me tell you more. Um, these people have been chosen. There is, there's, there's, there's a cadre, a group of very bright, very qualified, um, very highly able um, uh, young representatives of the human race have already been singled out and trained mm. to be the ones that will survive if we on planet Earth go to hell in a bucket in some way that is beyond our control, the ones that will Well, it's go like the, the doomsday line. seed bank yeah. thing, too, a right? Ab yeah. Absolutely, really, you know? Um, these guys have already been earmarked. It, it, the whole thing is just like a science fiction story. Let me tell you more before we get thrown out of the restaurant here. The, <laughs> I, I, I've got in incredible you always hang it right over um, the edge here. Uh, Back to what he was saying about, or back to what I was asking him about the, um, the catastrophe or the, the catastrophes that have befallen Mars that make it look like a kind of rocky wasteland. Right. Um, I said, well, you know, um, there's something here that we can learn as a planet about, it's like, look what's happened to that planet there. We've got to take care of this. He said, he said the Earth has been protected, you know. The Earth has been being protected. Hmm. And I said, how do you mean being protected? He said, well, he said, he said, in ancient times, there was a protection put around the earth to protect its extraordinary diversity, this extraordinary um, uh, uh, biosphere, this, 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 this amazing, I mean, some people call it a zoo, this incredible life um, on this planet. And I said, well, what form does this take? He said, it's a Val Allen belt. Van Allen belts. The Van Allen belts. The, the, they're not a natural phenomenon. Hmm. They're put there by... It's the, uh, the, it's the radiation yeah. blanket around the Earth yeah. that keeps cosmic rays yeah. from causing us to have skin cancer as much as yeah. we, you know, a lot worse than we do yeah. now if they weren't there. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to live here if it wasn't for the Van Allen belts. I said, were, were they put there by our ancestors or our creators? Or, and he said both. Hmm. And then I said... Now, that reminds me, tell me something here, because I'm really curious. It's a question we'd never asked him. Because a lot of the people 
Bart Sibro and other people have, have, have legitimately questioned whether the Apollo missions made it to the moon by saying, that, look, you know, they couldn't have made it through the Van Allen belts. It's like going into a nuclear reactor and out the other side. You can't do that with that mm. kind of technology. How did this happen? How did this happen? You know, you couldn't have done it. They couldn't have gone to the moon. This is a load of nonsense. You know. And so I said to Henry, look, this is a, this is a crazy question. Did we make it to the moon? And there was the longest silence. And eventually he said, yes. But it's not quite as simple as that. Oh, Christ. And I was thinking everything that you're thinking right now. This is a live conversation, guys, okay? He said, yeah. He said, but we went there with help. Mm. We went there with help. He said... Every, every Apollo we, mission yeah. had UFO sightings surrounding the ship. Every single mm. one that's been documented. Mm. And He's, the fact is that almost all the Apollo astronauts were Freemasons. He said that there was non-human engineered, there's a non-human engineered ultra-lightweight nano-shield built into the Apollo capsules that protected them from the radiation. Because some people have been saying, look, you couldn't get through that stuff mm. without two feet of lead, you know, and the thing couldn't have moved, you know. Mm. They had that technological help, and they had another kind of assistance. I, I may have told you this before, mm. but one of the things that Daniel told me was that there's a little box from Monsanto, it's about this big, you could run your whole house on it and it never runs out. It's free energy. Mm. They had that in the 60s that they put it on the Apollo mission on some of the landers and so mm. forth, secretly snuck it in as something else and that it was used, you know, for a source of power when they needed it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and um, they had something like that that worked as a sort of radiation deflector, like it deflected stuff as well. They had these two devices. They had a shield and they had a deflector. Hmm. And they also had something, um, and he wasn't specific about it, he said um, uh, that enabled the LEM to land, the lunar module, to land and to take off. He said right. to me, what do you notice about the LEM as it took off? And I said, no blast Daniel crater. said exactly the same thing. No blast crater. So this is, uh, I don't even want, know what day it is. It's Friday the 7th of December? Is that right? Friday the 7th of December. And I just landed in LA about three days ago. And one of the first things we wanted to do was catch up with uh, David, David Wilcock, who's become a very good friend over the last few months since our last interview. And we're in a beautiful restaurant here. We just had dinner. We happened to have our cameras in the back of the car. And we found ourselves having such an interesting conversation, we figured that we'd 
better capture this for the benefit of anyone else who's not, who's not here, which is the way that Camelot always likes to operate, if we possibly can do, is to provide for the viewer the best possible substitute for not being here in person. So we wish you were here with us in person, and this is the best that we can do. Yeah, uh, we're here at the Inn of the Seventh Ray. This is a restaurant in Topanga, California. It's one of my favorite places to go. Uh, and they were kind enough to allow us to use what's called the church room. So this is where we are right now. Uh, we've been discussing some very intriguing material. As probably most of you now know, uh, we did a video. Uh, I did a video with Bill and Carrie, who are both here with me at this time. And we went through a variety of different subjects, but the primary focus is what's really happening in the world right now. We're seeing uh, uncertainties and tensions unlike anything in recorded history. We're seeing government turmoil, economic turmoil. Uh, most people want to believe that the government is sort of like a benevolent parental figure that can be trusted implicitly. And there's more and more information that not only is there institutionalized corruption, but that there's a great deal of information that relates to uh, visitors from other planets who are actually coming here at this time. And uh, both, both Bill and Carrie have been doing a phenomenal job, in my opinion, of bringing out this information to the world. Um, so you've heard a little bit from Bill, and let's hear a little bit from Carrie. Uh, thank you, David. Actually, what we're doing here is we're very interested in comparing notes on two of our witnesses, which is uh, David's Daniel and our Henry Deacon. And we have found in the past that there are actually some times when they correlate or agree on certain, certain aspects of their testimony about what's go really going on out there. And we're fascinated to find out um, because we just heard from our Henry Deacon, um, and in particular, we're going to kind of concentrate on Bill because Bill spent some quality time, as it were, with Henry Deacon over the past week. Um, and I spent a little bit of time with him, but most of the time Bill was with him. So Bill is going to be contributing what Henry Deacon had to say, some updates about where he's coming from, what he what he had to say in the past, and then maybe a little more specifics um, in terms of what the future may hold. Um, in, and then David has uh, some testimony from Daniel, we understand, that we've never heard from, um, and that is, uh, or, or, or maybe, some, some very um, interesting disclosures mm -hmm. about what Daniel encountered in the past in regard to mom talk, and a few other things. Fact, so We are talking about the deepest, most concealed aspect of the UFO phenomenon you could possibly imagine. These witnesses are the absolute cream of the crop. We're talking about stuff that you have not seen in the Disclosure Project, and then eventually trying to basically stabilize this so that it's a usable technology. That's the basis of Montauk. It sounds very far out, but you have to understand like Philadelphia Experiment. If that's true, it's probably only the first time that that was done, and it was perfected over the course of years afterwards. So, yeah. I had the fascinating experience of sitting down with Henry personally and showing him the video of you talking about... Oh, really? Daniel. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> we sat together, we watched this video, and I was just like, okay, let's... and. This is like the reverse corroboration here. This is like finding oh, okay. out from Henry whether what Daniel was saying through you was, was accurate or not. Mm. And he watched, the, he watched the whole thing, at least that whole section. He just nodded. And, um, and what was really interesting was he couldn't remember your name. He kept calling you the blonde guy. The blonde guy. <laughs> So he said, what that blonde guy was saying, he said, <laughs> what the blonde guy was saying was absolutely correct. Really? He said. But he I'm said not surprised. Um, I mean um, with one small variation and this and this is this is just one of these lovely little touches and it's yeah, like, I haven't heard any of it. It's like you know this is real. He said what did he say it was? He said um, it's, it's, he said they're not called stargates. It's jump gates. Jump gates jump not, gates. No 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 no. He yeah. said he said they're jump rooms. Jump he said they're rooms. jump rooms. 
And, and I started to pay very close attention because this is the kind of, it's like, it's not, but then afterwards I realized that you'd said it was called jump gate technology. But I was talking with Henry and I was talking about jump gates. So I changed it a little bit with my own memory. And he said, no, they're jump rooms. And Daniel said, didn't know what, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if he had the word jump gate from them or not. But basically, for in case you, you're not following this, a, a jump gate is allegedly a stable, traversable wormhole between two locations, which works whenever you want to go. That's I'd heard that it was probably called jump stuff that has never come forward before. We're talking about the most esoteric, the most difficult to comprehend and understand as something that could even possibly be true. And it's to the point that I do get emails from people when I describe some of the Daniel testimony who simply cannot get past the barrier of their own belief around it. So it is important to note that this video is a continuation of what we already started before. Uh, the intent is for you to be able to participate further in this discussion. Now, why I'm so excited today, frankly, is that Bill came here with all this new information that I don't even know yet. So you're going to get my first-hand original reaction as I'm actually hearing this for the first time myself. And that's pretty rare and unusual to be able to capture that on film, but that's what makes this good video. So um, I think I'll just start in giving you a little bit of, of a backstory on this because actually it was my writing about the Henry Deacon story that in fact brought about the collaboration with Project Camelot in the first place. Um, just to recap very briefly what the original story was with Daniel, I have a, a large background in the UFO field. I've been researching it for many years and I also have had what appear to be contacts with my own source, so to speak. And during that time, uh, I was able to make the acquaintance with someone who told me that he had worked on the Montauk Project. Now, you've got to understand, this is probably the most controversial. Um, what can you think of as more controversial than Montauk? I mean, <laughs> my, my experience of Montauk, my personal experience of Montauk, was, was, was exactly the same as you described in your first it's, interview it's with totally us. It's totally ridiculous. I thought it was nonsense. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even read the books. I know that you <laughs> picked up the book to read his entertainment. I wouldn't even I read, read the it first at all. one. And just as you encountered Daniel and he started saying, listen up here, this is real, and I was there. I had exactly the same experience with Henry, because in our first interview with Henry, Montauk occurred in the conversation. I can't remember exactly how. And he said, yeah, sure, that was real. It's a 40-year time loop. Um, Al Bielek says some weird things sometimes, but basically the whole thing is true. And at that point, I started to pay very, very close attention. Some people might not know the basis of Montauk. Why don't you, just so that we keep everybody in the conversation. Oof. Off to you. I'll, okay. Bottom line... The seat inside a UFO is more than just a seat, it's an interface with your consciousness. Now remember, if even one UFO sighting is real, then we're not alone in the cosmos. If even one disk is actually a saucer, it's not built by us, but built by somebody else, then you have to have a warp technology because we've seen disks that have disappeared in the sky. So here's the idea, you're in this chair, you focus your mind on a particular place you want to go, it opens up a wormhole in front of the saucer, you fly through the wormhole and you end up going where you want to go. So the testimony that I heard from this man who calls himself Daniel, it's not his real name, has never been duplicated. So I've had some people email me and say, oh, well, I've heard everything that you said before. Well, we only covered the part of Daniel's testimony in our last interview mm -hmm. that was already the same as what was in the Montauk books. I've heard other stuff that was not in the Montauk books. And you're Henry Deacon has all this stuff that's not anywhere, but then I'm reading your website with his testimony and I'm going, oh my God, this is the same stuff that my guy Daniel was saying to me. Now, and it's, it's ridiculously specific information, much too specific to have been just a chance overlap. So what you start realizing is we're talking about a unified construct here. So Montauk is basically a reverse engineering of a ship of a, of a seat from a UFO so that human beings are trained to run the chair with their mind, 
open up a vortex, send people through, some people might make it, some people might not, 